Okay, you have chosen uh, the, the blue pill, I think this is, or I'm not sure which one. <laughs> um, so you are presumably all alternative providers or interested in, in, uh, in the um, future for alternative providers and the future for HE. I'd like to introduce um, Ian Coates. I mentioned him, him in my speech this morning. He's the newly appointed Deputy Director for Alternative Providers and HE Governance at Biz. Um, started this summer. Ian, um, uh, Ian previously, previously worked in Biz for um, policy delivery um, responsibilities and other departments across Whitehall. So he's a very experienced um, civil servant and has already proven himself to be uh, an interested and um, open sort of a, um, um, hopefully a friend of the alternative fire sector and we look forward to working with him. Joining Ian will be um, is Rob Stroud, Head of Alternative Provider Engagement from Hefke, and Debbie Oliver, Head of the new AP Intelligence Unit at Biz. It's a, actually a joint unit between Biz and Hefke, so showing that their government is, is joined up as usual. Um, and we look forward to um, hearing more. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for the uh, introduction. Let me just check that this works. Perfect. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for staying in this session. I hope that you'll agree by the end of it that you made the right choice, and you can tell everybody at lunchtime how much better uh, this session was and how much more valuable than the, uh, than the one on Tier 4 uh, in the other room. No, I, I'm joking. I'm sure that will be uh, hugely helpful uh, as well. Um, uh, Alex has just introduced me. Uh, as he said, I've been uh, in post for around four and a half months now, looking after everything to do with alternative providers in biz. Uh, also have responsibility for degree awarding powers, university title, university college title, Hefke designation, uh, and temporarily, uh, for the sort of medium term, I also now have responsibility for widening participation uh, and sort of social mobility uh, aspects of higher education as well. The plan is that I start, then I'll hand over to uh, Debbie and Rob uh, to talk about their roles, and then we'll kind of collectively, I think, have plenty of time for questions and discussions at the end. When I um, agreed with Alex that I would come and speak here today, uh, I knew, of course, that uh, ministers had announced that there would be a green paper on the future of higher education in the autumn. Uh, now, obviously, I looked at my calendar and thought, well, the autumn in the civil service runs from sort of 1st of September till sometime in January. Uh, so, you know, what are the chances of the Green Paper actually being out uh, before the 14th of October? Less than half, but, but not unreasonable. As it's turned out, as you'll all be aware, we don't yet have a Green Paper. That does realistically constrain a little bit of what I would have liked to have said. It would have been lovely if I could have said the Green Paper was published yesterday and let me take you through what it says and what it means. I can't do that, but hopefully I can sort of begin to uh, set out the sorts of things that we'll be saying in the Green Paper, very much building on uh, what Joe Johnson said in his speech at the University's UK conference uh, on the 9th of September. Now, as I said, I've only been in post for four and a half months, so I like to remind myself of a little bit of history. This chart shows the spend on uh, student support at alternative providers uh, over the period from 06-07 uh, through to uh, 2014. When we opened up uh, the opportunity for alternative providers to access uh, tuition fee loans uh, up to uh, 6K uh, in 2011, I think the reality is that we didn't predict uh, the response uh, that would come from that, and we didn't predict the rate of growth uh, in student numbers, and hence the rate of growth uh, in spend uh, that came after that. That rate of growth was worrying, and it was obviously unsustainable. Uh, we clocked that, Hefke clocked that, uh, many commentators clocked that, and of course, as you'll be aware, uh, the National Audit Office uh, and the Public Accounts Committee also clocked uh, that there were issues here. And I'm guessing quite a lot of you will be very familiar with the steps that were then taken uh, subsequent to that, sort of from 2013 into 2014 and then 2015 to deal with some of the issues and I guess bring uh, a more sustainable uh, approach to uh, the way in which the alternative provider part of HE uh, was uh, emerging uh, 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 as, a, as a sort of market. 
And it's important, I think, in everything that I'm about to say that we don't lose sight of that history. That hasn't gone away, and it's crucial that we remember and learn the lessons of that, both us on the government side, uh, but also yourselves uh, who are out in the sector uh, in terms of what happened uh, during that period. So that's where we were, but where are we now? On the 9th of September, Joe Johnson said, to ensure students have real choice that reflects their diverse needs, we must continue to open up the higher education market and put in place a regulatory framework that reflects today's challenges. He also said this government values competition. We want a diverse, competitive system that can offer different types of higher education so that students can choose freely between a wide range of providers. You'll notice some of the words that are in there, diversity, choice, competition. But I do want to add another word, which is quality. Back in July, uh, we published what's commonly phrased as, as the productivity plan. Its formal title is, is Fixing the Foundations. Uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, just Google Fixing the Foundations and you'll find it on the gov.uk website. That had a number of things to say about uh, HE, which are, are up on the screen, and, uh, and I won't read them all out. But I want to pick out some of the phrases from, from this wording. The best quality education, the best providers, the best alternative providers. So government policy is very much to promote diversity, to promote choice, to promote innovation, to promote competition. But we haven't forgotten our history. Ministers haven't forgotten our history. And this is about quality in diversity, quality in choice, quality innovation, and quality in competition. Now, my particular focus is on opening up the HE sector uh, to allow the best providers to grow and to offer those things, the diversity, the choice, the competition, etc. And I know that's probably very important to you. That's why you've chosen to stay here rather than go and hear about Tier 4. But that is by no means, of course, the only focus of the emerging picture on HE policy. Joe Johnson has said that the Green Paper, when published, will cover the Teaching Excellence Framework, which I'll say a bit more on uh, in, in a couple of minutes. It will cover widening participation and, and the goals that have been set, both to increase the numbers of disadvantaged students and to increase the numbers of black and minority ethnic students uh, studying and succeeding uh, in higher education. And it will also cover the sort of future regulatory architecture uh, which we need to have in place in higher education to enable all of these things to happen. All of which, again, uh, I'm sure is relevant to uh, those of you here. I want to move on now to what this all means in practice, and I want to answer that question by looking at three different time frames. Where we are now, so what's already been announced, where we could be in a year's time, the things that we could change relatively uh, easily, certainly without primary legislation, and more speculatively, where we could be uh, in the future, in the longer term, uh, three, four years out from now. And I'll cover the sorts of issues that, that I've listed on, on this slide in, in a bit more depth. So first of all, where we are now. For specific course designation for alternative providers in, uh, for 2016-17, so that's the designation round that's currently active and I'm sure uh, several of you here will have been engaging with, we've made a number of changes. These are really a combination of two things, measures to respond to the sorts of issues that arose out of, for example, the NAO report uh, and the Public Accounts Committee inquiry, and also measures to open up opportunities to growth uh, for a number of alternative providers. And I've listed uh, on this slide the key changes. So the first three bullets, the changes we've made for uh, so-called small providers, uh, the opportunities for 20% year-on-year uh, increases and the opportunity to bid for a further increase in, in student number control. Those are all about growth. Now, obviously, the, 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 the initial uh, application round for redesignation closed uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and together with our HEFKI colleagues, we're kind of assessing the response to that. Now, many alternative providers have taken up these opportunities to grow their student numbers. Many haven't. 
Now, we're looking into kind of why uh, that, that those decisions have been taken, uh, obviously on an individual basis, but actually it feels right to me because some of you who are small providers want to stay small. You've got a niche. Uh, you've, got a, you, you've got an offering that caters for a small number of students, and you're quite happy to stay there. That's absolutely fine. But what we recognised was that some small providers actually don't want to stay small providers. They want to grow. They want to be able to... Ooh, I shouldn't have banged that, should I? Whoa. Um, gosh, that, that had a uh, surprising effect, didn't it? That was just to make sure... That was actually deliberate to make sure nobody had fallen asleep. Um, some small providers don't want to stay as small providers. They want to grow. And we wanted to offer the opportunity, uh, for example, for those providers to do that. So I think this probably represents sensible decisions, but certainly if any of you uh, have got views or insight into that, I'd be really pleased to hear it in terms of uh, if, if you've just engaged with this, if you've chosen to uh, apply to increase your student number control, or you've chosen not to, I'd certainly be really keen to hear what motivated that decision. The bottom two bullets then uh, reflect some of the issues we consulted on uh, earlier this year uh, and then announced uh, in July that we would implement. So as you'll be aware, we're looking for alternative providers to really gear up now to be able to prove to us that there are systems in place to test the English language uh, uh, capability of EU students prior to them joining uh, your courses. And we've also taken steps to ensure that alternative providers are supplying the same information set that is already in place across uh, the hefty funded uh, sector. It's been one of the frustrations I've had, to be honest, coming into this role, that there isn't the data we would want to see uh, about alternative providers. And I think that's not in any of our interests. It means that we struggle to kind of compare student satisfaction uh, outcomes uh, the offering that you've got in place with the offering that's there in the hefty funded sector. And actually some of the alternative providers that have voluntarily chosen to provide that information are performing really, really well uh, on those indicators. And it would be good to be able to sort of celebrate good performance more broadly. Something else that we've done very recently is lift the moratorium on applications for degree awarding powers, university title, university college title, and HEFKI designation. If you're looking for major changes in the guidance from what was in place up until uh, March this year, you won't find any. The guidance is pretty similar to what it was before. Uh, it's a little bit more comprehensive. We've tried to make it clearer where it was less clear. We've tried to streamline it. And crucially, we've now got uh, HEFKI sort of front and center of actually the operational role uh, of taking uh, this work forward. But the key motivation to uh, publish the, uh, republish the guidance and lift the moratorium wasn't to make big changes to the guidance, it was to open the doors. Uh, ministers were aware that there were some providers who were really keen to start working on their applications for degree awarding powers or university title and, and had been caught uh, by the moratorium, not just alternative providers, uh, potentially uh, further education colleges uh, as well. And so we wanted to open the doors so that any of you uh, or others who want to apply for any of these uh, statuses, you're now free to do so. And certainly very happy to sort of have conversations with you uh, as we are doing now uh, with some providers about what that might look like and how you can best go about that. Still on where we are now, I mentioned earlier the Teaching Excellence Framework, which has been uh, wi widely uh, touted by uh, ministers and widely commented on uh, in the media uh, and uh, on the internet. We expect that to come into effect in 2016 to then have its impact from 2017-18. And really, this is about promoting and recognizing excellence in teaching alongside the existing sort of promotion and recognition of excellence in research. The Green Paper, when published, is going to consult on a number of the key decision points around how we operationalize the teaching excellence framework. I'd really encourage you to engage with that. For example, how do we assess teaching excellence? Uh, there's been some sort of recent commentary on, on that, and it isn't straightforward. 
what metrics uh, are available that we could use to do this? How do we factor in contextual information? How do we assess teaching excellence? And also, how do we reward those who demonstrate teaching excellence? In a sense, getting the badge, te teaching excellence, is reward in itself. But should we go further? How do we go further? What does that look like for alternative providers, uh, for example, if you can secure uh, teaching excellence? I'll move on from where we are now to where we could be in a year's time. A number of ideas have been put to us over recent months and which could form part of our green paper consultation uh, as we uh, look to pull uh, that together. So for example, uh, one of the issues that's been raised with us is around the annual redesignation process that we have in place. Now we put that in place as an essential step to effectively regain control of the system uh, and to make sure that the courses that were being designated uh, met our expectations around quality, uh, around the financial sustainability management and governance uh, of the institutions providing them. But we also recognize very much that annual redesignation has a cost. It has a cost to us, it has a cost to HEFKE, a cost to QAA, most importantly it has a cost to you. And we also recognize it makes it very hard to plan ahead because, you know, you could be the best provider in the world, but you don't have any assurance and confirmation that you're going to get your designation in one, two, three years' time. So what are the conditions under which we might give multi-year designations? We want to retain the right to sort of revisit designations on an annual basis in some cases, but we recognize in other cases it may be appropriate to look at multi-year designations. So hopefully we'll look to put something on that in the green paper. Another area that's been raised with us is around the amount of time it takes to begin to actually get specific course designation or to get degree awarding powers. And there's good reason for that because we need to be confident uh, that providers are going to meet the standards associated with uh, funding student support uh, and with awarding degrees. But people have raised with us, could we be more flexible? in the way in which we approach this, and could we therefore uh, make it uh, at least a little bit quicker, a little bit easier to get into uh, these areas? And we hear a lot of concern also about validation arrangements. You'll probably have uh, seen uh, Joe Johnson's analogy that he used on the 9th of uh, September around Byron Burger needing permission from McDonald's uh, in order to operate. Uh, just to be clear, I didn't write that one. Um, but we recognize that there is an issue here, and certainly some specific cases have been given to me where those of you who are validated are put under quite significant constraint by your validating partner. What can we do about that? How can we sort of open that up so that you're no longer constrained in that same way? What can we do about that? Question mark. So again, that's an area that we'd like to explore uh, in consultation with all of you. So that's the sorts of things that we could look to tackle in the relatively short term, one to two years. But then we've also got our eye on the longer term as well. If we want to secure genuine diversity, competition, choice, innovation in HE, I think we probably feel that we need to go further, and that's certainly what uh, Joe Johnson was uh, intimating uh, on the 9th of September. And probably we need to sort of overhaul our current approach rather than uh, tweak it uh, at, at the margins. You'll have heard ministers talking about a level playing field for all providers. So this isn't just about those of you who are in the sector enabling you to really sort of do what you want to do, but it's those who aren't in the sector who are put off from entering HE because it all looks too difficult, too time consuming, not a good proposition. How can we actually sort of deal with that and encourage uh, the right providers to enter uh, into HE and improve the choice uh, that's available to students and to bring new ideas uh, and fresh perspectives into higher education? So again, we're hopefully going to uh, consult uh, on some of these longer term uh, possibilities as well and, and seek views on, on how all of that comes together. Before I hand over to, um, to, to, to Rob and Debbie, uh, and before we then move into questions, though, I do want to emphasize again that point around quality. 
ministers are very clear that students at the, are at the heart of this. The point of more diversity, more competition, more innovation isn't, if you like, an end in itself. It's about giving the best possible offering uh, to students. Students are at the heart of this. Student protection needs to be at the heart of this. Uh, and whatever we do, that's going to remain a really, really strong focal point for us. That's where I want to leave it. Uh, Debbie and Rob are then going to pick up the story around their role and how they can work uh, with you to uh, both support you and to hear your views and feed them into uh, this policy making process. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Debbie Oliver, and I head up the BIS part of the Joint BIS Hefke Intelligence Unit. And we're about to do a joint presentation with my partner in crime, Rob Stroud. Um, and it is going to be very much a double act, so um, any similarities to Markman Wise is purely coincidental. I'm the funny one. Um, hopefully, like Ernie Wise, you won't see the join in the presentation, though. Um, what we're going to take you through, we're going to take you through where the, where the unit came from, what the background to it was, what, what created it in the first place, um, and also what we do as part of the, the work of the unit. And then we're going to drill down into some of the detail about our respective roles, because there's a reason why we have a biz and a hefty joint approach to this. So we'll talk you through that. And then um, go into the things that we're going to be doing with providers over the coming months and years in order to have a more regular dialogue with people. Um, Ian's already told you about um, some of the origins of the, the unit in itself, and, and certainly that's where a lot of the origins of the unit has come from, from the um, NAO report and the PAC hearing. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, both providers and the department were very bruised by the experience of PAC, and there were very clear lessons to be learned from that. And that is what actually led to the creation of an actual AP unit within BIS, because before then, there were only um, small numbers of people working on alternative providers, and not full time. So there were only like 10% here, there, and everywhere of people, people working, where now we've got more, more dedication. Um, and I think because the department was so heavily criticized in PSC, the department, as a government department, has that role of providing assurance about the use of taxpayers' money and about protecting student interests. We're ultimately accountable. So we want to protect the reputation of UK higher education, and I'm sure that is something that is shared by every single person in this room. So uniquely, at a time when resources have been reduced, our resources were increased. Such was the importance placed on making sure that we, we paid the right attention to alternative provision. And there was a deliberate um, uh, attempt to join up the qualities that we have in biz, because there isn't any legislation and we need to have a, a regulator role, but also to harness the, um, the qualities that are present in HEFKE and the experience that they bring to bear. And you'll find as we go through the presentation, there is a theme of knitting things together and joining up generally across all of the organizations that you work with. So what about the role of the intelligence unit itself? What, what is it me meant to do? Well, quite simply, to provide that assurance. To provide assurance that we are getting value for money, that students' interests are protected, and that we're not going to be ending up in a, another PAC type hearing. We can't afford to do that. Um, and I think it's in all of our interests to improve the image of the sector. I'm, I've heard quite a lot from visits to providers that they feel that they've been tarred with the same brush that the image has, has been tarnished from the whole uh, PSCC uh, hearing. Um, whoever said that there was no such thing as bad publicity did not work for the British government. <laughs> now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to make sure that we can identify things at an early stage before they become problems? Because that's what we want to do. We want to have a regular dialogue with providers so that we're never in that situation so we can intercede early in the process and help you to address any problems or clarify any uncertainties. And, and what you'll find is that the whole ethos of the unit is very much one of a two-way dialogue. 
We want to be much more visible to providers and to go out there, visit you, be on the end of a phone, however you, however you want to, to have that dialogue. But we want to be there to have that, that, that two-way exchange. Um, and some providers I visited earlier in the year, the really unlucky ones got both Rob and me coming out to visit them. Um, so you, some of you will have had some sort of a, a flavour of that. Um, we also want to, to help some of, resolve some of those problems. Now, if people make the odd mistake, that will happen. And we'll guide you through that. If there are lots of mistakes and there is things of concern, then obviously we're going to take it further. But we don't want it to get to that stage, hence the ongoing dialogue. Um, and the other thing that we do is we will we'll continue to monitor compliance with designation in the same way that HEFCI do with the funded sector. That is the role of the unit uh, pending any uh, legislation coming through. And, and also part of the work, um, which I'll talk a bit, little bit more in, in a gr greater depth shortly, is about regular liaison with all of the different partners that work with alternative provision, such as the QAA, Pearsons, um, OIA, etc. cetera. Um, but to start with, I'm going to pass over to Rob for him to explain the specific role of HEFKE, and then we'll come back to me and I'll talk about the specific role of BIS. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, yes, yeah, so as Debbie says, I'm Rob Stride, Head of Alternative Provider Engagement at uh, HEFGE. Um, I stood uh, at this podium about 12 months ago with my colleague Catherine Penry from our designation team. And uh, at that point, I'd been in post for around a month, and I outlined a position that my role was new to HEFGE, and we were going to be developing our engagement with alternative providers. Now, this was before any of the National Audit Office or PAC hearings, and so actually, uh, while my role is very similar now, uh, the context around us has changed somewhat and that has, as Debbie said, that has been helpful in some sense that it's afforded us some additional resource uh, to be able to better um, undertake this work uh, as we go forward. Um, there are three main teams working uh, within HEFGE that work um, on alternative provider uh, processes. Um, and uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention the, the other two teams that aren't represented here today. I'm not responsible for these teams. I'm responsible for the, for the third one that, that we'll talk about. Um, but the thing that Debbie said about us all linking together is very, very important. And that's something we're doing both within HEFGE and between HEFGE and BIS as well. Our analytical services team, who uh, many of you if, you, if you have a student member control allocation, uh, if you've completed a HEAP survey before, you'll have been in touch with them. Um, they uh, are growing in terms of resource uh, to support the intelligence unit as well. To further um, support some of the things that Ian touched upon in his, uh, his, his presentation earlier, about getting better information, getting better statistical information, better information for regulatory purposes, and importantly in the future, better information information for students from alternative provider data. Uh, obviously this year is the first year that uh, data has been collected by our colleagues at the Higher Education Statistics Agency and um, it, we see it very much as you know, that that will be one of the, sort of the key source of data uh, going forward. What we haven't done is been able to get more under the skin of the providers, uh, of providers, not in a nasty way, but in a way of getting in there and actually understanding what's your individual operating context. So that's where um, m my team within the HEFKE part of the intelligence unit comes in. So we have a new uh, engagement team. Um, we were fully staffed as of the 1st of September. So again, I have some, new, some, some colleagues that are very new to this and they're, and they're working very hard at the moment to get in touch with providers, introduce themselves and uh, uh, get their knowledge up and, and ready and we'll be going out there. Uh, we are going out there into the sector already. So our purpose, and the, the key word that's there in the middle of the slide is around communication, and that's what we really want. We want communication with providers. This isn't a, about us going in and telling providers what to do. Uh, it's about communicating with providers. We will help explain what you need to do to be compliant with the regulatory systems. Uh, we will also take feedback from you on how the policy and the processes are working. Um, as I say, this will be achieved through direct engagement, and this is something you perhaps, 
if you've ever worked with the Hefke funded sector, this is exactly how Hefke works with, with those institutions that it funds. You would have uh, named points of contact, and now as alternative providers, you will have named points of contact, both within Hefke and importantly, because this is a joint unit, and I, I cannot stress that enough, you have a named point of contact within the biz side of the unit as well. Um, we will be conducting visits to providers. These aren't intended to be, uh, we're not going to be coming in with uh, checklists. Uh, we're not going to be coming in uh, you know, with white gloves on to make sure you've done the dusting. Uh, we will be coming in to talk to you about your organisation, to understand what your organisation is doing, what it wants to do in the future, uh, what opportunities there might be for you, what risks there might be for you, uh, what's enabling you, what might be holding you back, all of that sort of thing. Each of those conversations with every, different provi with every provider is going to be different, and we expect that. We expect it to be different. And the future engagement we expect to, to have with you, we expect to be different according to your circumstances. It is all about your context. Uh, and as I've already said, we will be there to guide and signpost to other services and sources of information. So things like uh, the prevent duty that you heard about just now from, from my colleague Steve, if you don't know about that and you need to know about that and you want further information about it, it's the sort of thing that you'd be able to come through your name point of contact. If there are changes to the course designation guidance, you can come through your name points of contact and we can make sure that you have uh, all of the information that you need so that actually uh, complying with the regulatory processes should be a simple and easy process for you. Uh, I think I'll hand back to Debbie now who's going to talk to you about the biz uh, role within the unit. Thank you. Right, the biz, um, the biz role is slightly different obviously um, because we undertake that regulatory role and we provide some of the inputs into the designation process. As part of setting up the AP unit in total, we've changed some of our governance arrangements and we now have um, an alternative provider decisions board. That decisions board meets either weekly or fortnightly, depending on where we are in the cycle, and it makes decisions about designations, sanctions and student number controls. So we're responsible for organising all of that and making sure those decisions are taken timely and communicated. Um, but another key part of the role within BIS is, I referred to earlier, is this liaison role with lots of other partner organisations. And what we've done is we've, uh, in addition to the governance, which is much more board level, we have very personable one-to-one -one arrangements with a wide range of organisations. We have um, very successful working relations with QAA, with HESA, Student Loan Company, with the OIA, Home Office, Student Funding Agency because this is a wealth of uh, information intelligence that we can pick up across the whole sector about what's going on and pick up some of the key messages, and that's quite important to us. Um, it's also been quite powerful in helping to broker some help to individual alternative providers, because um, we can see if somebody's having a problem with some of their SLC inputting to data, then we can get somebody out from SLC to go and do some intensive work with the provider again to stop things from becoming a problem later down the line. And we've done that, and that's worked really, really well, and it's been really appreciated by the providers that we've done that with. Um, obviously, uh, when things don't go quite according to plan, and we see things that cause concern, we will initiate formal investigations, or informal ones. It depends on the nature of what comes up. If it's something of a relatively minor nature, then we'll probably pick up the phone and say, look, can we come out and talk to you about this? We've, we've spotted this, we're a bit concerned, or you've done this, you need to stop doing it. Um, if it's a somewhat more serious, then we will trigger formal investigations. Now those investigations um, can either be, they fall into two categories, they're either fraud or non-fraud. So they're quite broad, broad categories, but fraud, is anything whereby a, a provider financially gains where they shouldn't, uh, uh, which is typically things where there is a whole scale claiming of um, tuition fees when there is no student in attendance. Thankfully, we're seeing fewer and fewer of those. Um, so hopefully the number of inve formal investigations will reduce. The unit isn't actually responsible for those investigations. They're done elsewhere in the department uh, because of the nature of them. But we do get heavily involved and we usually participate in them, not least because we tend to do a lot of the follow-up action afterwards. 
to make sure that the provider does what is recommended in the report. Um, the non-fraud ones, we do lead on those, and they tend to be things around claims about teaching quality, which is where we liaise very closely with the QAA, um, or things where students feel they've been missold a, a qualification and the, that they're not actually doing the qualification they think that the, they were signing up to. So all of those things we take very seriously. And as part of that, we get a lot of whistleblowing allegations made. Um, I do want to reassure you that we take whistleblowing allegations with a lot of seriousnesses, but we do need to go on evidence. Everything we do is based on evidence, and I think it's fair to say there's a bit of wheat and chaff in whistleblowing allegations. We assess both, and with the gentlest of hands, blow the chaff away and keep, keep to the real nub of the issue that we get raised. Um, another thing that we do, we impose sanctions. Yes, of course we do. Um, we need to make sure that we maintain the quality of provision of providers. Uh, and I'm conscious that the next one talks about promoting and defending providers. You might think, well, you know, you, you, you say on one hand you're going to sanction us and on the other hand you're going to defend us. Well, it sort of reflects the dual role that we have of the iron fist and the velvet glove. We do have to impose sanctions where we find uh, misdoings. But I would like to reassure you that we don't take that lightly. Both myself and my colleagues are very acutely conscious that if, any, if we impose sanctions, it has the ability to close a provider down. It, we don't shirk from taking them, but we don't take them lightly, and we only do it when we've got hard evidence and we are fair and proportionate. The other aspect is this bit about promoting and defending providers. Uh, because, uh, and I'm going to give you a real example that happened earlier this year. Uh, because we have that dialogue, where we are able to then talk with authority about providers about what actually happens on the ground. And I found this personally when I went out and did my provider visits earlier in the year. Um, the specific example, just to give you a flavour of the power that the, the uh, intelligence unit can have, is uh, we announced earlier in the year we were going to um, impose sanctions in the light of performance data. So if providers' performance data wasn't very good, then we reserve the right to alter student number controls uh, 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 in, in accordance. There was a whole raft of emerging data that came out to show that the performance of some providers wasn't very good. Now, under normal circumstances, those providers would have had their student number controls halved as part of that policy. But I said, uh, and I was, I was successfully defended providers by saying, well, look, I've been to see these providers some of the data, yes, the, the data isn't very good and they've said that, but actually they've given very credible reasons why the data is the way it is. And I believe them. It's, you know, I'm not in the contest of disbelieving people. They give me the evidence, talk me through all the things we're doing to improve. I can see that that's happening on the ground. I don't think that would be a fair and proportionate sanction to impose. Um, and that is actually what happened. And providers will not have seen that. They'll have just seen everything go through smoothly and get the student number controls, and they wouldn't have seen any of that defence of their physician taking place. So that's the sort of thing that we can do when we have that knowledge and that intelligence of how you work, which is why the dialogue is so important. Um, and also part of working with you is, it, Rob's emphasised this, it is, it's that two-way uh, traffic. We want to hear how policy is being delivered on the ground. What are the things that are working for you? What isn't working for you? Tell us what isn't working. And again, the, the power of the visits is, is, is quite good because I learned on the visits that one-year designations was actually very difficult for you to plan ahead for your finances. You know, in any business, you want to plan ahead three to five years hence. You've heard Ian talk about the potential for multi-year designations. We do listen, um, but obviously you need to tell us. Um, you also told us that you need us to be clearer on requirements. We're trying to address that as part of the designation guidance. Um, another message I picked up was about late decisions on designation. We're really trying, um, and again, you won't see this behind the scenes, but we're doing an awful lot of pre-planning to make sure that the current designation window goes much more smoothly and you get the decisions as early as possible next year. Um, Equally, we need to make sure that p providers are behavior, behaving in the intent of the policy. So that's part of what we would need to do, make sure that what we are trying to do is actually being achieved on the ground. 
and for you to, to let us know. Um, and the other thing that really struck me was when I went out on visits is the number of people who said we've never seen a biz official come out to visit us. And there was almost like this culture of fear, which I was completely flummoxed about because I was going out in all innocence. Oh, I'd like to talk to you, learn a bit more about what, how you do things. You know, there's been PAC and I'd quite like to know some of the bits that, that sits underneath that. And it's like, I'm really scared. You're a biz official. What are you going to do to me? You're going to hit me with a big stick. And that's, okay, yes, I know we've got a big stick. Um, but that's not how, <laughs> you, know, I'm not, you know, I've got to be honest. Um, but that's not how we work. It's not in our interests or the interests of higher education in this country for us to be um, to have poor quality provision. And that is what we are concerned about. So please do talk to us and, and be honest and open with us as we will be with you. So it's a slightly changed approach to probably what you're used to um, in, the, in the years that's gone by. I'm going to pass you back to Rob, who's going to take you through some of the practical steps, how this is going to look like in reality and the sort of things that you're going to see. Thanks, Debbie. So, yes, so just to wrap up quickly now, talk you through what our recent activities have been and, and what our forward look will be. Um, hopefully by now, every provider with designation for new students by, well, I know by now, for uh, every provider with designation for new students for academic year 15-16 will have had a notification uh, from us of who their named points of contact are within Biz and Hefke. If you are a provider with course designation for 1516 and you don't know your name points of contact now, um, please come and find myself or Debbie during the lunch break and we will uh, take a note and uh, make sure we, we resend the letter out to you. It did go out by email uh, quite a few weeks ago now. Um, between October and February, we're going to undertake a round of visits. It, it says February. It's probably more likely to be en end of March now, I think. Um, but our aim is to visit all of the providers with specific course designation. And the individual contacts that you have will start to write uh, to you to, visit, uh, to arrange those visits. Uh, we've done some already. Some people have already uh, luckily uh, had us knock on their door very early on in the process. Um, but for others, because there are 120 plus providers to visit, it may take us some time to, to get round to you. We are very happy if you have a particular reason that you would like to speak to us, come and talk to us and we can look at how we adjust our programme and schedule to get you in. Um, uh, we are very flexible, we are uh, very adaptable. This first round of visits is a generic sort of round, it's an introductory session. We can, we can look at tailoring and adjusting those as appropriate. Uh, launching very soon, something that uh, my corporate communications department would be delighted that I'm promoting, is there will be a, a stakeholder survey that Hefke is launching. Uh, so this is not quite one of the joint activities, but one of the sections on it is around the future engagement that we will have, and I can assure you that the findings of that Hefke stakeholder survey, what do you think about working with Hefke, etc., etc., uh, will be fed into to, uh, my team within Hefke, and that will influence the joint working that we're doing with Biz and how we go forward and plan future activities. Uh, my team particularly uh, will be working very closely with those of you that have to do heaps uh, across December 2015 to January 2016. Uh, this will allow some continuity uh, as to who you are dealing with. I'm very conscious that in the past, if you've done heaps, you've dealt with someone else. Uh, someone different who you would have dealt with for your course designation. Uh, my team uh, will pick up a lot of the work on the HEAPS uh, processes. Um, it won't be all of them because, again, uh, the number of providers doing HEAPS would mean that um, my team wouldn't be very happy if I volunteered them for all of it. Uh, but we're trying to make it a much smoother relationship so that um, we really uh, develop those in-depth understandings of individual providers. From spring 2016 onwards, sort of Easter next year and onwards, we'll have been around everybody, we'll have a much better understanding of everybody. We will look at then how we tailor our engagement strategy according to the individual needs of your organisation. That might mean, for some of you, we don't see you that often, we may not speak to you that often, and you may be delighted at that. Um, for others, it may mean that you would like more regular engagement with us, and actually we come out and see you on a much more regular basis, depending on what going on in your organisation. I want to conclude very quickly. Um, one of the questions I often get asked uh, by people at the moment is, okay, you've said you're going to come and visit us, so do we need to provide you with lots of data? Uh, who do I need to have there? What do I need to do? Is it going to be really scary? Um, the answer to all of those things is, 
not really, no. Um, it is a general introductory visit. These are the sort of topics that we're covering uh, in the first round. We're trying to give everyone a fairly consistent agenda, though there is some, as I said, there is tailoring that we can do according to your individual contacts. So we want to talk to you about information about your provider, and we, we, I've called it their factual information and strategic plans, which sounds quite grand and formal, but actually what we're interested in is hearing from you about you know, what is the background of your organisation, where is your organisation going, what, is your, what, what are your visions for your your organization so that we can really have that good understanding again linked to what Ian was talking about earlier in terms of growth in student numbers that sort of information you know maybe you are happy being a small provider and you want to stay a small provider well that's that's great and um, it'd be helpful if we really had that understanding um, we want to talk to you as Debbie said about what, what I call their sector intelligence and provider feedback what impact is policy having on your organization at the moment what feedback can we give to biz and to other organizations uh, that, that are working in this space to help them improve their work with you and to help us improve our work with you uh, we, we've got a section at the end uh, which we have called an open discussions uh, section uh, where we're, we, we recognise there are lots of different things going on in policy at the moment. A, a colleague was talking to me out in, in the uh, break about, oh, there's this consultation, there's that consultation, and there's this thing that I've got to read. Uh, so we're giving you an option of, of picking a few things effectively from a menu of choices that perhaps are the hot topics for you or things that you don't understand or things that you, you would appreciate just a discussion on. Um, it's interesting at the moment of the visits that we've, we've scheduled in, um, everybody so far has chosen uh, TEF and quality assessment as the, uh, one of their uh, hot topics at the moment. I can't imagine why. Um, and then at the end of our, our, our visit, we'll set out what we think our next steps will be. There's a standard next step of, you know, we will formally record all of this, but actually uh, how can we develop our relationship with you in the future and what would you like to see from us? And that's, that's, that's the first round of visits, and like I said, my colleagues are being in touch uh, with people at the moment. So I'm going to conclude there, um, and I think we've probably got a few minutes for questions. Alex is nodding. I think we've got a few minutes for questions, so... I think Ian probably wants to come back up and answer questions as well. <laughs> yeah, near the, near the front. Uh, from Regent Group. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a policy question which I like to ask, and um, especially the Pearson qualification. Uh, on the moratoriums, I believe, still we can't really add any other courses. But an interesting observation I had, in fact, we are one of the organizations, Debbie kindly visited and supported us. And um, the qualification has a five-year window. The funding is for two years. And some of the learners who are taking access of the widening participation and they are adults, and they are taking advantage of that five-year. And I think there is a conflict on policy I think we need to really sort that out in terms of, okay, if you are doing a two-year qualification, like a foundation degree, we can give you a one more year to complete. But if you have the five-year window, it is very difficult as an alternative provider to tell the student, you know, we run schools, so we can put them on um, um, <laughs> some kind of a, we can't do that for higher education. So I think that that's an area, perhaps we need some clarity, how we can deal with it and how as alternative providers, because what tends to happen is it comes as a dropout, but not necessarily they are suspending their qualification at times. And the second issue in terms of linking is SLC. I think we really need to make sure there is a proper linking because as a private institution, if the time delays are happening and at the end of the day, it's the learn alone they are taking, we don't have no authority to go and talk about it but if the loan sanctions doesn't come, we can't provide a service. Yeah. And that has been a huge, huge challenge. And it's continued to be a challenge, especially when you have staggered intake. September, they are beefing up the people. But when it comes to January, again, winding participation, they're not here to study every September. So those are the two policy issues. And I'd like to know, what's the future of HN? Because again, we are tied. Yeah. You know, we only have business qualifications. We have student numbers, which we haven't really utilized last year because we want to diversify. So just like to find out, Ian, what's your thoughts on that? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. A um, few points uh, to make in, in relation to that. Uh, firstly, on the uh, moratorium on uh, new uh, 
uh, higher national courses, that does remain in place. Um, we are very actively engaging uh, with our colleagues in biz responsible for vocational education to really look at the future of level four and five qualifications. And this, I think, is sort of tied up in that wider debate. So it's a sort of watch this space uh, answer on, on that one. Um, specifically, though, uh, part-time uh, learning, distance learning, uh, accelerated degrees, all of those flexibilities within the system are ones that we are very much looking to uh, promote. Uh, you'll be aware, I'm mean, slightly off, uh, off piece from, 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 from your question, but the, there was a manifesto commitment around two-year accelerated degrees, but generally ministers are very keen that we look to promote those. So uh, again, that is an area that, that we're very actively engaged with. Um, and then thirdly, around the student loan company, I mean, we, we have, I think, a, an ever-improving uh, relationship with colleagues at the SLC. Uh, I actually chair what we call our um, alternative provider information group, which brings together uh, the different parties that I think Debbie listed on one of her slides, including the student loan company, and where we are picking up issues uh, from providers, uh, both individual issues and more generic issues, uh, we are using that forum and bilateral discussions to highlight those and seek to resolve them. So I wouldn't claim that it's anything like perfect, but we do now have a kind of forum and a set of channels to actually take these things forward. So do very much keep sharing them with us. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, there was a hand up somewhere towards the back, I think. Uh, and. Um, Sheila Singh for London School of Academics. Um, one of the biggest barriers was the VAT issue on student loans. And I wanted to know, when you talk about playing, uh, the playing field, making it level for alternative providers and universities, is there going to be a policy out there for alternative providers not to pay VAT on student loans, whereas universities don't pay it? So can we also be exempt from that? Um, thank you. Uh, uh, no, I have to confess, it's not my favorite topic because it's horribly complicated. Um, rest assured, it is an ongoing discussion that we are having with HMRC uh, and with uh, Treasury. Um, it is horribly complicated. I wouldn't even begin to start to sort of uh, um, outline the issues because I'll get it wrong. My message is that it's, it is on our agenda. Uh, I can't promise an immediate resolution, but we do have a dialogue with HMRC and with Treasury about this. Okay, because um, the main purpose of um, getting people educated and them getting out loans is they get better employment. So if they're going to go into jobs, that's where I'm saying exactly. Yeah. it ain't fair. Yeah. Okay. Other, yeah. Thanks. Mark Hunter, ICMP. Just a quick question for Debbie or a point. Um, you raised uh, a sense of surprise that there was some anxiety in the sector about visits from biz. Um, you work for something called the Intelligence Unit. <laughs> uh, one might reflect upon the nomenclature and how that's used elsewhere. It would be really helpful to have that clarity around the tone and style of the visit so that we don't over-prepare with data analysis and and, and stats and, and pages and pages of stuff for you when actually you want to come and have a chat over a coffee and say, how are you doing? What are you doing? How can we work together? So some clarity over that in the same way that our students appreciate clarity over moments of formative and summative assessment, I think we would appreciate the same thing. Um, the reason I said that um, I was surprised at the sort of um, censure I got when I went out on the visits, um, it was in February and I was only in the second month in the job. so. Uh, I was relatively new, so I wasn't expecting this, this sort of wave of anxiety to come across. Um, I, I very quickly learned. It was a very, very steep learning curve. Um, the, uh, the question about um, clarifying where it is we want to go to, to come and talk to you about, um, I'm going to ask Rob just to say something because he's leading on that, that part of it. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. We, we're not expecting, this is not a sort of inspection visit. Um, you know, we won't be turning up unannounced or anything like that. It will be in liaison with you at a time that is convenient and suitable for you. And the agenda f uh, w is something that we will share and, and discuss with you in advance. It is 
that kind of ha let's have a discussion and a, a chat about you as a provider. Some providers may choose and have chosen to provide us with some more statistical information about th themselves as part of that, but we're not coming in saying uh, we want you to do this particular data analysis for our visit or anything like that. It's, it's a discussion about you, about your organization, uh, about where you see yourself going in the short and medium terms, um, about what policy is impacting upon you at the moment, what you think about current policy and how we might be able to support you uh, around that in the future. Thank you. Can I, can I just um, add to that? Um, any, any provider that is, is a good quality provider has absolutely nothing to fear from us. I'm tempted to say that her name's Oliver, Debbie Oliver, and she's licensed <laughs> for informal conversations over cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to scare anyone. Um, it is a brilliant idea to have you guys coming around and checking and then um, discussing with us of things that obviously um, on how we can work all together. Is your um, visit the same as the HESA visit or is this two separate visits? Uh, no, it, it's two separate visits. Uh, colleagues from HESA will be coming to talk to you particularly about the, the requirements for the, the HESA return and do an induction session. And uh, uh, Alison, who I did say, who is just there, is from HESA. No, it's a separate, it's a separate vi visit. They will look particularly at those requirements around the data return and, and how to do that and uh, the, the complexities of compiling an appropriately formatted XML file and that sort of thing. Okay, we thank won't, you. I won't be talking about that. <laughs> can, can I just add to that as well, that one of the things we're trying to do again through our kind of information group and, and sharing across the, the various different bodies is to coordinate on all of this. So it shouldn't ever happen that you sort of get uh, Hefke in one day, Biz in the next day, HESA in the next day, QAA in the next day, or at least if that does happen, we'll know about it and we'll be managing it to try and be helpful to you. Um, because we are trying to kind of compare uh, diaries and make sure that we are joined up. Thank you. Hello, uh, David Greenshields from the London School of International Business Studies. Can I just ask you about the teaching excellence framework? Um, it seems to me that you're, you're still out in consultation with this. I was wondering whether if you're going to be visiting alternative providers, you might be asking about how they approach and what they see as excellence in teaching. So for example, we're very much using London as a laboratory with very much active learning, students going out and interviewing people. We use a lot of technology, so discussion board. So teachers actually putting in place activities and um, using the technology and coaching and mentoring would be seen to us as very, very much a part of their job role and excellence. Yes, we, we are not formally out for consultation yet. So when the Green Paper is published, there will then be a consultation period uh, running off the back of that. And that will certainly be the time to engage. And I think you're, you're right to highlight that sort of issue because what we're very much not a, going to be about is a sort of prescriptive approach to teaching excellence. One, we need to be consistent with academic uh, freedoms and, and the principles around that. But secondly, we want to encourage diversity uh, of approach and meeting the needs of different students and different settings and different courses uh, will require diversity. So we then set that against the need to actually have some way of measuring teaching excellence and, and having a kind of objective process around that. And that's the kind of big challenge. So what I would very much encourage you to do, uh, certainly individually, uh, when the Green Paper is, is, is published, is, is look to respond. Uh, what we are also uh, hopefully going to do is uh, run some national events uh, on the Green Paper that uh, uh, anybody, certainly alternative providers, anybody will be able to sign up to. Uh, and then I'll certainly be having a conversation with uh, Alex and, and, and Joy and, and colleagues at Study UK around perhaps how we might kind of convene a, a sort of focus group type discussion around some of the uh, policy areas that we'll be looking at uh, so that we can get views in in that more uh, sort of tailored fashion. One down the front and one uh, in the middle.
Hi there, Gordon Sweeney from the Point Blank Music School. Uh, we obviously had the performance pool and 20% increase for full-time student numbers. Uh, it's been alluded to that for distance learning or part-time students, there's going to be information to come in terms of growing that. Yeah, that's right. So, so this has been the first year that we've actually had uh, student number controls on part-time uh, and distance learning. Um, and what we've said is that we will effectively sort of review the kind of take up uh, and when we get the data in probably around uh, January time, I think is right, looking at sort of Rob and Debbie, um, we will then look to sort of make a decision about where we go with that. But because it's all new, we kind of want to see uh, how the numbers are sort of panning out uh, and then be able to announce off the back of that uh, where we go with um, student number controls and part-time distance learning in the future. So yes, it's a sort of um, probably early early next year will be when we're in a position to do that. There was a question down the front. So it's probably the last one unless anybody waves and sort of looks frantically at me with a burning question. Uh, otherwise, this will be the last one. Hello, Anne Miller from the University of Buckingham. Um, something I'm interested to know is, and I'm very interested to hear about the intelligence unit's um, intention to go out amongst all alternative providers. Do you see it as eventually distinguishing more between the different types of providers? Obviously, Buckingham has fallen between two stools at the moment, well, for many years. But we do tend, and, and I'm sure a lot of providers are lumped into this one group. And I think I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you're saying, what Deborah was saying about the, the, the contextualizing different alternative providers. How quickly will that happen? Uh, I'm just giving you a, an example because we've had a letter from, from you telling us um, what we're, we're required to do now under the data requirements as an alternative provider, having been doing it for 12 years. So yeah. I think that distinction uh, will be important for other alternative providers. Yeah, I'll maybe say something, and, and Debbie and Rob may also want to, to comment. Um, I mean, alternative providers, it was one of my first reflections when I joined this role was that I hated the label. Uh, I'll just be very out front about that. I don't like the term. It's really odd. Uh, but it's kind of what we're stuck with, and it has a sort of, uh, it has a purpose, and it has a definition. Um, and uh, so it, it is there, and we, and we use that to have a particular meaning. However, the point you raise is that within that, there is massive diversity. Uh, you have some alternative providers who have university title, uh, some who have degree awarding powers but not university title, and those who have specific course designation. And then, of course, out there, there's all those providers who have franchised courses uh, and that they're uh, delivering with uh, university partners, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we are very much in the wanting to get into the world of engaging with each provider on their own individual terms, where they are, what they need from us. And I think having the resource we've now got is a big step towards us uh, being able to do that and being able to tailor our engagement in a, in a more sort of intelligent uh, way, which is maybe why we call it the intelligence unit as opposed to the other sort of uh, uh, intelligence. But um, I don't know if Debbie and Rob want to comment as well. I mean, in terms of the individual contextual stuff, I mean, there is obviously some stuff that's already obvious. Um, those providers that have university title, degree awarding powers, um, is one way where we can already look at differences in the sector. Similarly, those providers that are offering uh, mainly validated degree provision versus those providers that are offering uh, higher national and sub-degree provision is another way that we can look at it, at things at the moment. But it's really once we've done this first round of introductory visits, I think that's when we'll have a much better understanding of, of you as a provider, and particularly as someone with, with UT and DAPS, how you might be then different from other UT and DAPS providers as well. So it, it, it really is drilling down to quite a detailed level, and I'm... I'm uh, I'm coming on the Buckingham visit in a few weeks, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing about it then. Thank you, everybody. I think we're probably out of time, but thank you very much for that. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ian, Rob, and Debbie. I, I've certainly found um, um, in the last few months they have a very open and collegiate approach to interactions with our sector. So I, I would encourage you to engage with them in the same, same spirit. Um, and it is also a big vote of, vote of well, confidence. It's a, I think it's significant 
that the department and HEFI have put in this additional resource at this time, a time of austerity and budget cuts. So um, I think we should welcome that. 